hello, hello. It is uh, November 4th, 2020. I am recording as a distraction. I hope you are having as good of a day as well, you're watching this in the future. So I hope you're having a fantastic day. Welcome to Lawn Looks, where I smoosh together law and makeup to talk about some of the more interesting or fun cases that I learned about in law school. Quick disclaimer before we get started. Nothing I say can or should be construed as legal advice. I cannot give you legal advice. If you do need legal advice, please obtain your own attorney and seek counsel from them on any particular matter. Okay, let's get into it. Because because this one's a little, a little soapy, a little spicy, but in the end, very legal. So hopefully I can break it down. Not so dryly. We're gonna start with eyes today because I have this Ipsy Tetris palette that I have never used before. And I don't know, I just don't wanna use it. And if I hate it, I'll declutter it. Today, we're talking about Bond versus US. This is a, at its heart, a domestic dispute that brings in some treaty powers, chemical warfare, and bioterrorism. Also, the facts of this case are way spicier than what happens at the Supreme Court, but we'll get to that. So, in 2006, a woman named Carol Ann Bond is informed by her best friend, Merlinda Haynes, that Merlinda is pregnant. Carol Ann is... I don't know if she goes by Carol Ann or Carol or what Ms. Bond is extremely excited for her best friend. Over the moon, Merlinda is going to have a cute little baby. It's gonna be great, it's gonna be fantastic. But then Carol Ann finds out that the baby's father is her husband, and Carol Ann is mad. She's mad her husband stepped out on her, she's mad at her best friend. Now, Miss Bond works as a microbiologist at a pharmaceutical chemical like processing plant in Pennsylvania. So she acquires some substances from her work as well as some substances from Amazon and she smears them all over her best friend's car, mailbox, doorknob in order to poison her best friend. Now, Miss Merlinda Haynes gets away relatively unscathed. These poisons, very bright, they're like bright orange or bright white. You could like spot them from very far away. She suffers a burnt thumb and that's about it. That can be treated by just like kind of rinsing it underwater. You know, still not great, but no, no horrible, terrible damage is actually done done. I have no idea what I'm doing. Let's see if this works. Merlinda Haynes does report this to the local police. The local police don't really do much. They actually start to investigate Merlinda Haynes as a drug lord herself. And it's kind of like, um, no. Someone's attempting to like hurt me through like the use of all these chemicals. But in the end, the local police are not very helpful. However, remember that Miss Bond also tried to poison her friend by putting these chemicals on her mailbox. Your mailbox falls under federal jurisdiction because remember that's the US Postal Service. So Merlinda Haynes also contacts the US Postal Service police and they set up surveillance videos and basically catch Carol Ann Bond in the act. Once they catch her, they arrest her and under state law, she probably would have been convicted and spent between like three months and two years in prison. But they decide to charge her under the Chemical Weapons Convention instead. The Chemical Weapons Convention is an international treaty that is aimed at eliminating the production and use of chemical weapons. Now, nothing in the treaty itself prohibits individuals from making and using chemical weapons weapons. Instead, the treaty is what's known as non-self-executing, meaning that the countries who sign on to it have to make their own domestic laws to make that conduct illegal. And Congress, wouldn't you know it, had enacted such a law under which Bond was to be prosecuted. So Carol Ann is actually prosecuted under this law and she gets six years in prison, which is three times the amount she would have gotten if she was prosecuted under state law. So of course, Miss Bond wants to fight this. I'm sorry, I keep flipping back between Carol Ann and Miss Bond. I think that's just how it's gonna, how it's gonna go. Now, Miss Bond's case actually 
goes to the Supreme Court two different times. On the first runaround, she's arguing that the act infringes on the 10th Amendment because it makes like a quote-unquote garden variety state crime into a federal offense and that infringes on the 10th Amendment, which gives states the right and the powers to prosecute these kinds of crimes, and the act essentially infringes on the state's powers to do so. The Third Circuit, before it got to the Supreme Court on that first runaround, said, no, Carol Ann Bond, you don't have standing to raise this issue because the 10th Amendment protects states, not defendants, so the state would have to raise that issue. You can't do that. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's wrong, Carol Ann Bond can raise that issue, and they basically said you can use your 10th Amendment defense, and they sent it back to down to the court to try it again. And when they tried it again, the court said, no, the act is constitutional and it applies to Carol Ann Bond, so we will uphold the six-year conviction under the federal offense. So then Carol Ann Bond is coming back and saying that this treaty cannot apply to me. Now, when this case was going on, there was a lot of talk about how this one domestic dispute could potentially change United States treaty powers forever. And to fully understand this case, we need to delve back into some U.S. history. So let me just finish up my foundation and then we can go back in time. A bouncy, 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 bouncy. So we are going to rewind to the American Revolution well, post-American Revolution. The United States has won the war and we get Britain to reluctantly sign the Treaty of Paris. In that treaty, the United States as a nation had agreed that the individual colonies and states would pay back Britain to restore money and property seized from British subjects during the revolution. But states and courts would not cooperate. Do you remember that, I think it was Ben Franklin, maybe? Maybe it was Washington. There was like that uh, join or die picture with the, with the snake that's like chopped up. And Washington even voiced his concern that, you know, yeah, we won the revolution, but who's going to take us seriously as a nation if we can't even act like a nation, if we're internally can't get it together. So the states weren't cooperating in restoring the money to British subjects. So then Britain was like, well, then we're not going to cooperate. And it was all a huge mess. So what on earth was the United States to do? Great question. Glad you asked. So before we had the Constitution, we had the Articles of Confederation and those weren't working. And you could see that with the treaty powers and like a whole bunch of other things and the government. The federal government just didn't have enough power to like keep everything together and run as a nation so that the United States could enter the world as a nation. What was I doing? Highlighting. So. When the Constitution was being drafted, the framers decided to tackle this problem head on. They said that we'll give the President and the Senate together the power to enter into treaties with foreign nations. The states cannot enter into treaties with foreign nations. It has to be the United States federal government, the President, the Executive Branch, and the Senate part of the Legislative Branch. And this, you know, has worked pretty well, especially when you consider World War II, NATO, etc. It's helped put the U.S. in a position of global leadership. So people were really scared about how this domestic case with Carol Ann Bond would affect the treaty powers. So Carol Ann is heading back to the Supreme Court now in 2013, I believe, to argue that the treaty should not apply to her and or the treaty itself is unconstitutional. Basically saying that the treaty power gives the president and senate too much power. Now one side of the argument is that the president and the senate together can increase their powers and back in 2014 people thought this was kind of a ridiculous argument. They're like there's no way the president and 67 senators would conspire with a foreign nation like China or Russia to do insidious things. I mean, today, maybe that's, you know, not the most implausible thing in the world. But back in 2014, we lived in a different time and we were like, haha, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Presidents don't 
do that. How ridiculous of an argument. The more plausible argument, and the one that the majority at the Supreme Court took, was that the treaty did not apply to Carol Ann, and they reversed her conviction. Essentially, they said, when looking at federal laws that involve traditionally state law subjects, such as criminal law, the courts should find that the federal law only overrides state law if Congress intentionally intended for it to. Here, the court found no clear indication that Congress intended the Chemical Weapons Act to apply to conduct like Carol Ann Bonds. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the majority opinion in this case. All nine justices agreed that Carol Ann Bonds' conviction should be overturned, but six of them found it on non-constitutional law bases, and three of them would reach the constitutional question. We'll get to that. But Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the majority opinion, and in it he said that the conduct and even the chemicals that Carol Ann Bond used were not the type of chemical weapons that were contemplated for this treatise or the ultimate law that Carol Ann Bond is being prosecuted under that was enacted by Congress. He even said that the other side, the government that was arguing to have the Chemical Weapons Act apply to Carol Ann Bond, he said, if the government reading, the government's reading of the chemical weapons ban would sweep in everything from detergent under the kitchen sink to the stain remover in the laundry room. In fact, he continued, any parent would be guilty of a serious federal offense, possession of a chemical weapon, when exasperated by the children's repeated failure to clean the goldfish tank, he considers poisoning the fish with a few drops of vinegar. Which, I read that line to my mom, and my mom was like, oh my god, yes, I totally understand. And I was like, who, why are people going around poisoning their children's goldfish. Goldfish don't even live that long, but apparently it's something that you have to be a parent to understand, so I'll concede that one to my mother. So the six justices who concurred in this opinion, or joined this opinion, basically were like, listen, Carol Ann Bond's crime is serious, but it shouldn't fall under federal law in this manner. It should be a state law criminal prosecution, especially because this federal law has only been used a hand full of times for crimes that were way more serious than bonds. So let's not get overzealous, shall we? On the other hand, there was a dissent by Scalia. Thomas and Alito also dissented and wrote their own concurrences, but Scalia decided to answer the constitutional question of whether Congress can use its treaty powers to pass laws to put treaties into effect in the US. Now, the majority didn't go to this question because it was practicing constitutional avoidance. Constitutional avoidance is basically when a court refrains from answering the constitutional question in a case if the question can be answered on other grounds. It wants to avoid interpreting the Constitution. But Scalia, Alito, and Thomas would have answered that constitutional question, and in their view, it was without a doubt that the federal chemical weapons law applied to Bond's conduct. And they would have struck down her conviction for the fact just because the Constitution allows Congress to approve treaties does not mean that the laws passed in order to enact those treaties treaties in the U.S. are constitutional, and they would have found the federal law unconstitutional and therefore overturned Miss Bond's conviction. Now, unsurprisingly, Scalia gets to this point by taking a really hard textualist approach, one that just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> Thomas's concurrence basically said that there has to be some international aspect to it, there has to be some interrelation with foreign nations. Alito's was kind of similar stance. Scalia was just very afraid that the president and the senate would concoct a scheme with a foreign relation to overturn big federal laws like not having guns near school. United States v. Lopez was all over this case. For me at least, it doesn't make sense given the constitution's language that this would be a thing. I just, I, I didn't super understand Scalia's stance on this, but I disagree with Scalia a lot in his opinions. Oh, I forgot to put setting powder on. Oh well. I knew there was a step that I was missing. Anyway, in the end, it didn't have like a very big impact on treaty powers. It was a little bit anticlimactic for like the way it started out with the whole kind of soap opera setup, trying to poison your best friend for having a baby 
with your husband which not condoning that behavior but I understand why she was mad and I did try to find where Carol Ann Bond so Carol Ann Bond was set free she wasn't convicted of anything I couldn't really find a lot about her Merlinda Haynes or her husband I didn't look too hard either because you know these are still private citizens I don't want to like delve in too deeply into their lives and invade on their privacy if they do like public interviews and stuff I can usually find those if there's news stories or things written about them in journals that stuff I feel okay sharing but I'm not going to try and detective out like what these people are up to I don't really know what happened to any of these people but I do know that the treaty power was saved and that my friends is Bond versus United States. Thank you so very much for watching me. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe if you feel inclined to do so, but absolutely no pressure at all. I am just very, very happy that you made it all the way to the end of this video. <laughs> I got my Leonard V. PepsiCo shirt held learn to take a joke do check them out use the code law looks for two dollars off again i don't receive any money from that you guys just get a discount my next video has been a highly requested video from my family and friends you guys want to see how i do my makeup step by step so be on the lookout for that this eyeshadow look is uh not my favorite but I did something different and that's all that I was planning to do so I am happy about that. Let me know what you think about this case, Treaty Powers of the United States. Take care of yourselves and I will see you all next time. Bye!